Hey guys, Jeffrey from Headstrong Training Systems here. So today we're going to, I'm coming at you guys with another programming video, um, and in particular we're going to be talking about how we, how we manage pain. So how we manage um, pain and injury in an athlete, where it's become it's coming to a case where it's become a, a chronic long term injury. So it, I'm not talking about acute flare ups of maybe say um, something like you know something happens, there's a spasm or um, you know there's a cramp, um, but rather a, a chronic condition where it's lasting over maybe two weeks now and it's affecting um, it's it's reoccurring and it's consistently affecting the movement that the athlete can perform in um, it might start to affect their day-to-day -day ability to stay pain help stay pain free and healthy and it also might start start to be affecting their mental state so when we get into managing pain the overall consensus is you want to obviously first reduce the amount of stress um, that's uh, that's being performed at that, that that injury site so you essentially you want to be reducing inflammation and promoting recovery um, so first of all you you want to be um, reducing the stress that's occurring there, but at the same time, you don't want to completely cut off any movement there. You don't want to completely detrain because how pain and injury works is every um, joint, muscle, tendon, ligament, whatever it is, whatever it is in the body, um, it's got a it's got a tolerance. It's got a, an ability to tolerate a certain amount of load um, and tolerate a certain amount of stress before it leads to injury, and so basically what when pain occurs or when injury occurs you've pushed past the limit of that um that area to tolerate the amount of stress and load and so that's why pain is occurring but then so when you start to reduce that load and you reduce the stress that's occurring there obviously we're going to, we're going to be reducing that information and um, promoting recovery but at the same time if we were to completely detrain and then and not provide any stimulus to the area the ability so that the um the tolerance capability of the area will also decrease so essentially we don't want to completely detrain because then we lose um, the ability of the area to tolerate any stress at all so it's about finding the balance between pulling back on the amount of stress that's being provided to the athlete so that you know that error can sort of calm down and sort itself out but then also not completely detrain and still providing some sort of stimulus so that to the load to um, tolerance of that area can still be maintained or even improved and so to kind of decide how much stimulus you might give to an athlete um there's no objective rule there's no black and white rule so it's kind of all about managing and trying to figure out what the athlete responds to and what works for but essentially a general rule of thumb is on a scale wanted a pain scale one to ten one being nothing at all barely anything and ten being excruciating pain you kind of want to sit around a two to three um pain on the pain scale so you're kind of essentially providing enough stimulus to keep the athlete going promoting recovery and not, but not too much to the point where it's worsening the area so now as we get into the video, I'm gonna be talking about the main variables that I would look to adjust and the, the variables and protocols that I'll manipulate in order to keep the athlete um, on track and essentially provide them enough stimulus without worsening the condition. So the first topic area or the, st the first protocol that I will look to manipulate is technique and volume. Now I wanna say that the, you, when you look at technique and volume, I, I, I wanna just provide this broad concept that um, no matter how bad your technique is, technique doesn't cause injury to an extent. I want to say to an extent because obviously you can go to extreme cases and obviously inefficient technique isn't what we want and because it will, it will cause injury and will cause leakages. But essentially you have to wrap your, your head around the idea that no matter how bad your technique is, it comes down to a dose-response relationship and it comes down to volume or how much um, stimulus of that technique you give to the athlete that will cause injury. Because for example, if you had the worst technique ever, like you know, just the worst technique ever imaginable, if you were to only ever do even just 50% of your 1RM one times a week, um, once a week, that's it, I would say that you're, it's very unlikely that that will lead to injury, simply because the dose of that bad technique isn't reaching the level that will cause injury. Uh, and so that's why I say that there's always a dose response relationship when it comes to uh, volume and technique because um, but then in saying that it's not I'm, I'm not trying to advocate for in completely ignoring technique no, even if it's super if it's very bad it's because obviously that then limits the ability and that puts a seating cap on the amount of dose that the athlete can handle because if you're, perform, you're performing your movement with a very inefficient technique, then your athlete can't perform many a lot of volume with that bad technique because then it will cause you know uh, it will cause injury. So that's why I, I, I first want to just put out the idea of a dose response relationship. We have to find out how much stress the athlete can tolerate and without worsening pain. 
um, and usually that's why I say the emphasis on is, emphasis is on volume for more like you know intermediate to advanced lifters who already have a good grasp of the movement concept. But if you obviously if you are a, a more novice lifter and the movement pattern is clearly inefficient and clearly causing problems, then that would be that's definitely an area I would first address as well. So just it, it's kind of about finding the balance between. Um, obviously you want to clean up technique if there's an obvious issue but if but then you also want to look at the importance of volume and managing that in order to to reduce pain so to wrap up that first concept um technique and volume is kind of the first area that i look at i'll first look at technique to see if that there are any um very obvious issues that's causing the problems and if not and there is any manipulation they needed then i'll first i'll look at their stress and the amount of volume that they're handling see if that anything's different uh, any differences have occurred there from the last block uh, to kind of prompt us into a direction of finding out why this new stress and why this new pain is occurring and so i would then look to manage volume and essentially pull back on the volume um so that the, you're not constantly pushing the athlete into a, a zone of causing pain. So now that you've first looked at technique and volume, the next area that I want to talk about where we will look into is volume and intensity. So the concept, uh, the idea of, of this is basically you want to explore in what protocols and in what ranges can the athlete work pain free. And in some instances of injury and pain, um, it's that they, they can't tolerate loads, load, so they can't tolerate a high intensity or high load, but they might be able to manage um, higher reps, so um, more volume but lesser loads. And so that would be that would definitely then be the direction that you continue to work in and continue to explore in order to provide a stimulus to the athlete. Or in fact, it might be true in the other, other direction where the athlete can't handle um, a higher volume, so higher repetitions at a lower weight, but they might be able to um, handle a high intensity but at a lower volume, so you, then you might explore. So then you might explore or just giving a couple singles there as a protocol because that's what the, the athlete is able to tolerate and, and able to handle. So the first two um, topic areas that I first talked about are situations where the athlete can kind of continue to do the movement uh, pretty pain-free so they're able to do essentially the, the whole competition movement without too much problems. But now we go to a more, a more heavier case where um, say the athlete can't do a certain part of the movement so maybe they can't hit death on squats or on bench they can't cut, um, come to their chest, they can't come all the way down um, so or maybe on deadlifts they get pain starting the bottom position because of how more hip dominant lean over the torso is so this would be a situation what we would look to do now is to constrain the movement essentially you want to then manipulate and constrain the movement and provide the athlete um, a, 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 t a type of movement that doesn't um, work in the ranges of causing pain in order to allow them continued exposure and continued stimulus. And what I mean by that is, say example, if you've got an athlete who gets pain in the bottom of the squat because of the, of the knee travel that's occurring, you might get, give them a pin squat set at a height that doesn't elicit pain or you might give them a box squat. Or say on a bench press, they can't come down and touch their chest and that because of that the range of motion occurring there, you might give them a spotter press or, or, then, or you might also set up a pin press there that stops them before they get to the level of pain. So Basically, with this concept, it's all about finding and, and manipulating and adapting the movement, and so that they can, uh, so that they can still get as much specific exposure as they can to the competition movement without further eliciting pain. And then with that, you would essentially kind of with the recovery as the, the tolerance of that area builds up and that pain goes down, you would then start to progress progress over week by week or even block by block by slowly moving back that adaptation back to the competition movement. And now the last topic area that I want to talk about is basically the use of accessories. Now, there are two situations where um, accessories will be used. First of all, I want to talk about a very extreme case where the competition movement can't even be performed or any variations of it. Just simply any movement at all in the area will elicit pain. And then in, t in situations like that, in order to continue promoting, um, prompting expo muscle exposure of that specific area, then you might start to look at accessories or very pullback version um, just simply to get exposure in the muscle so that that muscle doesn't completely become detrained to stimulus and then secondly i would also look to use um, accessories to supplement the movement as in in order to um, build up the tendons or ligaments if they are the, the causes of pain let's say being damaged um, you might start to look at um, tempo works or e eccentric or isometrics um, because they're so slowing down the movement i, I found that often um, reduces pain because when the the muscle joint has to work fast then Obviously, the, the areas, so the tendons and ligaments will also have to work harder in order to control the, the explosive nature of the movement. So when you slow it down, then less lesser um, force is needed by the protective um, 
protective areas, so like the protective ligaments and tendons around the area, and so that that their work rate or their workload isn't as high. So um, by slowing down with either tempo or even going, even take another step back and give you an isometric, that can be ways that you can still continue to pre- perform movements and continue to provide exposure and provide a, a controlled amount of stress to the area to strengthen it um, and not worsen um, damage to the area. So that's all for me today, guys. Going over a few, um, the main areas or the main variables that I will, look, I will personally look to um, adjust and manipulate and play around with when managing pain, um, chronic pain. Um, basically, the summary or the key idea of this video is, you want to find what areas your athlete can work in without pain and whether you have to manage pullback on volume, pull even pullback on frequency, um, or um, maybe manage the manage the movement itself and provide the movement um, in a in a, stim, in a stimulus way where it, it, it doesn't prompt further pain or injury, then I think that's definitely the way to go. It's about finding what the athlete is able to tolerate and then building back up that stress capacity. So that's all for me today guys. Hopefully that's helpful for you and I'll catch you guys next time. Take care.